Welcome aboard, everybody. Dr. Peter Glidden here, your steadfast advocate for health. Thanks for coming. Sorry for the delay. We had a little bit of a technical problem. That's the deal with live events. Welcome aboard. For those of you new to this venue, I'm a licensed naturopathic physician. I graduated from Bastyr University of Naturopathic Medicine in 19. 19- 91, and I have 27 years of clinical experience helping people recover their health with science-based, clinically verified medical therapeutics. This is part of my ongoing educational series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about an alternative cancer treatment, uh, the false placenta theory. This is a free worldwide event. Most of my educational material is offered via a subscription service on my website, but four times a year we uh, develop and deliver robust, free information because we are all in this boat of crazy medical monopoly together, and knowledge in this instance is so much more than power. It is the difference between life and death, so let's kick it off. <clears throat> Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, would be spinning in his grave if he were alive today because this is what he said over 200 years ago. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize itself into a dictatorship to restrict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privileges to others will constitute the Bastille of medical science. All such laws are un-American and despotic, and that is exactly what has happened here in the not-so-free 21st century over the last 200 years, more or less. We do not have a free medical market. The MDs are at the top of the pecking order, not because their therapeutics are better, more effective, more uh, uh, cost-effective, safer because they bullied themselves into the top dog spot uh, with the help of the American Medical Association, the Rockefellers, and the Carnegies in the early 1900s, and there has been no looking back. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time we took a breath, relaxed a little bit, and attempted to gain the proper perspective on what's really going on with health care. Here it is, modern medicine from the proper perspective.
Now, the reason for all of this doom and gloom is not because your <clears throat> medical doctor is a bad person or a sadist. It's because your MD is trained in a philosophy of medicine which is old-fashioned, outdated, and inconsistent with the reality of the human experience. But mental inertia being what it is, it will take generations to die out and be trained or understand new ideas, the ideas that the naturopathic doctors, that the Ayurvedic doctors, that the traditional Chinese medical doctors and acupuncturists are talking about. It's going to take generations before the information that we bring to the table finds its way into the mainstream. Your medical doctor may be the nicest person that God ever created, but your medical doctor does not know what's best for you. They only know what they've been trained in, and what they've been trained in is one particular type of medicine. It's referred to as allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine is based upon a reductionistic philosophy, which argues if it can't be measured, it does not exist. Since nobody has ever dissected the soul out of uh, the human body, nor seen it with an MRI, a CT scan, <clears throat> or an ultrasound, it doesn't exist. To the allopathically trained reductionist, a.k.a. the MD, your body is a machine. There is no soul, there is no spiritual force, there is no vital force, and the body does not have the ability to fix itself. The argument goes, well, if the body could fix itself, it never would have gotten sick in the first place. So interestingly enough, your medical doctor is not trained to cure disease. I'm going to say this one more time. Your medical doctor is not trained how to cure disease. They are trained how to manage disease. Think it through. Can your medical doctor cure heartburn? No. They can manage it. High blood pressure? No. They can manage it. Arthritis? No. They can manage it. Meanwhile, while they manage it, they create an unbelievable opioid addiction crisis here in the United States. Because when you manage things without getting to the fundamental root cause, it's only a matter of time until things get worse. And this is also why MD-directed allopathic pharmaceutical centrist medicine is the leading cause of bankruptcy. In the United States it is. Why is this? Because, well, what's the most expensive type of medicine? It's the one that doesn't work. Now, Look, this is just by way of perspective, right? This is not an MD bashing session. It's just the way that it is. And you need to know the way that it is before you make a choice about who to go with for your particular situation. So in the wonderful world of medicine brought to you by MD allopathic reductionistic philosophy, each part of the body gets its own treatment right? So one medicine for the blood pressure, one medicine for the heartburn, one medicine for the insomnia, one medicine for the blood pressure, one medicine for the fibromyalgia, one medicine for the arthritic pain, and so forth and so on. And then, of course, a couple of medicines to take care of the side effects of all those medicines. And meanwhile, nothing gets cured. You need to understand that this is the medical philosophy and the treatment, the clinical treatment strategy that your medical doctor is brought up inside of. This is directly opposed to every other type of physician in the world. The naturopaths, the chiropractors, the homeopaths, the herbalists, the acupuncturists, traditional Chinese medical doctors, Ayurvedic practitioners, the oldest system of medicine on the planet. We are all holistic in our philosophical underpinnings. And holism argues <clears throat> the human body is a system of integrated parts. You don't treat the part, you treat the system. You actually don't even treat the disease, you treat the person in homeopath in naturopathic holistic medical philosophy. There is in fact a soul. The soul is embedded as in the body mind and when the spirit or the soul leaves the body, the body is just a dead hunk of meat. It is the spiritual force present inside the human body which is running the show which conventional medical doctors take no notice of whatsoever. And because of this, they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. This is a fundamental distinction between allopathic MD medicine and every other type of medicine in the world. 
because holistic medical philosophy argues the body knows how to fix itself, the body wants to fix itself, the body is trying most of the time to fix itself. So it is the holistic physician's job to assist in this process. So we're trained in the clinical application and the delivery of, of medical treatments that support and promote the body's built-in God-given ability to fix itself. This is the major distinction. Holistic physicians attempt to cure the condition. MDs attempt to manage the condition. Now look, remember I said this is not, you know, the MDs are evil and everybody else is great. This is just by way of perspective. Because of their training and grounding in reductionism, the wheelhouse of the medical doctor, where they're very effective, is trauma care, surgery when it's necessary, and a handful of infectious diseases. This is the wheelhouse of the medical doctor. And when I'm elected king of the world, it will be illegal for a medical doctor to treat chronic disease. We don't let chiropractors do open heart surgery, do we? No, not, not, nor should we. And I love chiropractic medicine. But we need the right type of medicine for the right type of condition. But we don't have a free medical market. We haven't had a free medical market since the early 1900s. So the only medicine practiced in your hospital is MD-directed medicine. The only medicine paid for you by insurance, MD-directed medicine. The only medicine they research at universities, MD-directed medicine. The only medicine they make TV shows about, MD-directed medicine. And even though the MDs are the leading cause of death, the leading cause of bankruptcy, and under their tutelage and care, we're not getting healthier, we're getting sicker, they get a pass. And they have convinced most people in this world that everybody like myself and every other type of doctor who does not have an MD after their name, no matter how well educated or vetted they are, is a back-of-the-bus quack with substandard dangerous training. It's an Orwellian nightmare come true. Constant surveillance is liberty. Bad medicine, expensive medicine, dangerous, ineffective medicine is the best medicine modern science has to offer. It's nonsense. We need perspective, and we are lacking it solely. <clears throat> now look, you're welcome to your own opinion, but not your own set of facts. MD-directed medical treatments for chronic illnesses don't work. If they did work, we would be getting healthier, but we are getting sicker. And when it comes to cancer, it's a nightmare. Cancer keeps on rising. The projected numbers for cancer are jaw-dropping bad news. Every day, approximately 4,600 new cases of cancer show up. In the United States, 1,600 people die from cancer a day, the 21st century. We've spent $900 billion, probably more now, probably over a trillion dollars. And we've given it to the medical profession that doesn't even know how to cure heartburn to come up with a cure for cancer. And this is why these numbers are so bad. Because we've taken the wrong dog to the hunt. Your medical doctor is the, the perfect person to go to if you have a broken leg or a bullet in your arm or pneumonia most of the time. But if you're suffering from cancer, they are the wrong dog for the hunt. You know, we talked about this in the first webinar that I did, so I'm not going to beat this horse. But the reason that another reason that this is happening is because it's gigantic money. It's gigantic money. Now, what we're talking about tonight is a very interesting alternative to the MD directed Machiavellian monopolistic medical madness that exists in the medical marketplace in the 21st century. Interestingly enough, this is the exception, I believe, that proves the rule. These therapeutics were um, brought to the table by a dentist and two medical doctors, a medical doctor and a researcher. So, every once in a while, a medical doctor gets it right. An MD gets it right every once in a while. And this is one of those cases. We're going to talk tonight about something called the false placenta theory of cancer development. 
And by way of education, I'd like to start at the beginning. It's a good place. Now, here's a cutaway section of a baby in utero. Uh, on this side, of, this side of the screen is the front of the mother's body, the belly. And on the back side of the screen is the rear end. You can see the backbone there. The baby is sitting inside the uterus. And if everything is the way that nature intended it to, then uh, there's the uterus. The baby's inside it, and there's the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord attaches the baby's the baby to something called the placenta. And the placenta is how the baby gets nourished. It's the umbilical cord to air and food and water and waste elimination. The baby's swimming in an amniotic fluid, the baby is underwater when it is inside the mother's body, and it is the umbilical cord that keeps everything going, and the umbilical cord is attached to the placenta, which is an unbelievably fascinating part of the body. The placenta is running the show, keeping the baby's body alive. Here's a old-fashioned picture of the placenta. It's a remarkable uh, part of the human body. Here's a picture of the placenta immediately after birth. And this is where it gets very, very, very interesting. Now, if you didn't know that was a placenta, and I told you that that was a cancerous tumor, it would be easy for you to think, oh yeah, man, it looks like cancer to me. Well, as it turns out, when you do a microscopic examination of the placenta, it even looks more like a malignant cancer cell, especially carcinoma. John Beard, a Scottish embryologist, Scotland, in 1903 made this observation. He observed that under the microscope, and even macroscopically, just looking at it, cancer cells resemble the pancreas. And not only do they resemble the pancreas anatomically, but also physiologically, because what does the pancreas do? I mean, I'm sorry, what does the placenta do? The placenta aggressively attaches to the wall of the uterus, aggressively grows its own blood system, aggressively taps into the blood system of the mother, kind of like a parasitic organism. It's very aggressive and it grows and nothing stops it. Well, there is one thing that stops it. But the point here is that, interestingly enough, the structure and the function of the placenta mimic the structure and the function of many types of cancer. Now, in the human body, the placenta stops growing, stops growing when the baby's pancreas becomes active. Now, remember, what's happening in the uterus? Well, the, the baby's growing. And every couple of days, something new forms, right? Ooh, the, here's the heart, and oh, here's the small intestine, oh, here's the large intestine, here's the arm, here's the leg, here, here's the liver, here, here's the brain, here's the eye, here's the pancreas. Now, right around day 53, more or less, of gestation, once the pancreas has formed and starts working, the placenta stops growing. Now... John Beard made the observation, the assumption, he promoted the notion that there must be something that the pancreas secretes in order to halt the growth of the placenta. There must be something that the pancreas secretes because that's just too big of a coincidence to overlook. The placenta grows and invades and grows and invades and grows and invades and then stops. And it stops at exactly the same time that the pancreas starts working. So, he took another step and 
he extracted pancreatic enzymes from animals. Specifically, he extracted two pancreatic enzymes called trypsin and chymotrypsin. So one of the jobs of the pancreas is to make insulin to help regulate blood sugar, and also it generates digestive enzymes to help the body digest especially protein. Two of these enzymes that Beard focused on were called trypsin and chymotrypsin. So he extracted these enzymes from animals because th these enzymes are virtually impossible to synthesize. Even in the 21st century, we can't make these up in the lab. We'll talk about that in a minute. So he injected the pancreatic enzymes into animal tumors and human tumors, and they shrunk. Cancer tumors shrunk. Imagine that. He published his results in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and he also wrote a book about it called The Enzyme Treatment of Cancer. Shortly after his work was published, it was put aside in favor of chemotherapy. We all know how unbelievably ineffective chemotherapy is. If you don't know how unbelievably ineffective chemotherapy is, please watch the first cancer webinar that I did called Cancer Chaos. It tells you the chemotherapy treatment outcome by the numbers. Again, you're welcome to your own opinion, but not your own set of facts. So, John Beard, in the early 1900s, made a remarkable observation. I mean, this guy was a real scientist, right? We observe and, and we, we think it through, and then we make a postulation, a scientific assumption, and then we attempt to prove it. He did it all the way through. But then, because I believe of financial interests by the pharmaceutical industry and the chemotherapy juggernaut, this treatment was brushed aside by the winds of history, and most people, well, it kind of fell into uh, darkness until just a little while ago. And I'm going to tell you, the two men that brought John Beard's theory back into active practice. But before we do that, again, I want to lay the groundwork here to help you understand the kind of the nuts and bolts of this. Okay, so... Here we have an artist's rendering of the female reproductive tract. Down here is, and this is a cross section uh, from top to bottom. This is the vaginal area. This is the uterus right here, the uterine wall. This is an ovary. And on the other side, there's also an ovary, two ovaries, right? And on the other side, they cut it in half to give you a cross section to kind of show you what's going on. And this is what happens in a woman's body every month that she's having a menstrual cycle. The uterus pops out an egg. It's called a secondary oocyte. Then that egg travels along the fallopian tube on its way to the uterus. And if on the way to the uterus it becomes uh, fertilized by a sperm, then and uh, then the, the, the fertilized egg implants successfully in the wall of the uterus, then nine months later, we're going to have a child. So in this particular diagram, this is the way <laughs> that the maturation of the egg and then the fertilized egg goes. And, you know, scientists have all these names for the different stages, right? There's the zygote and the oocyte, and for goodness sakes, this next one, the uh, morula, right? Now, who thinks these names up, by the way? Interestingly enough, one of the things that the American Medical Association did in the early 1900s, right around 1930, when they gained complete control over the education and delivery of medicine in the United States, and that power was granted to them by Congress, after something called the Flexner Report, one of the things they did to solidify their spot at the top was introduce Latin into medical terminology. Before 1930s, Latin wasn't a big part of medicine. Every now and then, 
But it wasn't until the American Medical Association did this wholeheartedly across the board that they effectively, by introducing Latin into medical education and medical research, took the fundamental concepts of medicine away from the common person and gave them only to the selected few who had the education. So for goodness sakes, the Morula, right? Are you kidding me? I guess the guy that named it that was a fan of Tolkien. Yeah, Morula. I am Morula, an orc from Middle Earth. It's nonsense. But that's the way that it is in the wonderful, misbegotten world of modern medical science. Now, the next stage in the development of the cell. So, this little single cell egg that's popped out by the ovary becomes fertilized by the sperm and then it starts to divide. First into two and then into four and then into eight and then it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. A very interesting uh, phase of this development is the formation of something called a blastocyst again. How do they come up with that name? God only knows. But the blastocyst is the part of the development of the human body which actually becomes implanted on the si inside the uterus and then the real business of forming a human being begins. The blastocyst is the key to this. And let's take a look uh, a little more closely at the blastocyst. Now, again, this is uh, a visualize a, like a, a, a basketball that's been cut in half, okay? This is this artist's representation of the blastocyst. <clears throat> in the bottom here, in this particular rendering, we've got a bunch of cells that turn into you, the human being. They are referred to collectively as the embryo blast at this particular stage of fetal development. These cells up here that go all the way around the edge of the blastocyst form the placenta. They're also um, uh, uh, have something to do with the, the formation of other parts of the child's body, but the trophoblast along the wall of the blastocyst are the cells which form the placenta. Now, these two types of cells, the trophoblasts and the embryoblasts, are what researchers make stem cells from. You've heard of embryonic stem cell research? Well, this is it. It's the trophoblasts and the embryoblasts that stem cells are derived from. Fascinating, very controversial uh, field of medical research because, of course, None of this happens until the egg has been fertilized. So this begs the question again, when does life begin? And is it okay for scientists to go in and kill the developing person to, in order to secure the stem cells? And again, it enters into the question, well, if the, if the child dies, heaven forbid, before these cells have matured into the next level, can we harvest them? I mean, is that ethical? I'm not going to answer that question tonight. But nonetheless, the blastocyst is the key thing to understand here when we're understanding the false placenta theory of the development of cancer. You with me? Okay. Kira, are you with me? <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. Now, <clears throat> what Beard postulated and discovered was that there are cells which mimic, well, there are trophoblastic cells that he referred to as germ cells, which are floating through the blood and are in many different parts of the body, not just the developing human egg. Now, this is interesting, and it was his supposition that under certain types of stress, which he could not determine, 
the trophoblastic cells, which were floating around in, uh, in different parts of the human body, would become triggered to grow, just like the placenta is triggered to grow. And this was his theory on the, one of the origins of carcinoma, one of the origins of cancer, that it was a trophoblastic cell in a distant part of the body, away from the uterus, which for biochemical or the, who knows what reason, that trophoblastic cell became triggered to grow. And of course, that's what cancer cells do very effectively. They grow and they grow and they grow and you can't stop them growing. Now, another thing that bolsters Beard's supposition here that cancer cells are false placenta cells is one of the things that the trophoblasts do is they secrete a hormone called human chorionic gonadotrophin, HCG. Now, most people know that if you think you're going to be pregnant, you go to the pharmacy and you get a home pregnancy test and you pee on the little stick and that little stick tests for the presence or the absence of HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin. Because if you're pregnant, you're going to have HCG in the urine after day 53 because that's when the trophoblasts are actively secreting it. Interesting, right? Well, this then begs the question, well, if Beard was correct and a cancer cell is a trophoblast gone rogue somewhere else in the body, then it must be associated with increased levels of human chorionic gonadotrophin. And what do you know? Over 80% of cancer cells, 80% of cancers secrete HCG or a variant thereof. 80% of tumor cells secrete human chorionic gonadotrophin or a variant thereof. And you would think that medical science would go, aha, let's work this backwards and think it through. But they don't. Because we don't have a free medical market. And most medical doctors are intellectual cowards. They're not going to rock the boat. They're going to do what they were taught in school. And they certainly weren't taught this in school. That's why it's called alternative treatments. Which, by the way, is one of my least favorite words, expressions. Calling, you know, what naturopathic doctors do, what other types of physicians other than MDs or what enlightened MDs do, alternative, is like saying the only real type of dog is a German Shepherd and every other dog is an alternative dog. It's nonsense. That's just a little pet peeve of my own. 80% of cancers secrete HCG or a variant thereof and the scientific community does not give a damn. They're perfectly happy with generating radiation treatment, surgical treatment, and chemotherapy, which makes them rich and does not work. Max Planck said at best, the guy that discovered quantum physics, science progresses one funeral at a time. Because most scientists are anything but open-minded and intellectually courageous. Most scientists tow the line, even if it's a bad line. And that's just the way that it is. Now, this false placenta theory of beards was revisited in the early 1900s by William Kelly, He's a dentist, DMD, and Nick Gonzalez, who was a medical doctor. And Nick Gonzalez died under mysterious circumstances uh, a year ago. Uh, God rest his soul. But in any event, this is kind of the evolution of how this false placenta theory started to come back into the light. Um, Dr. Kelly developed pancreatic cancer. And he cured himself 
of pancreatic cancer. He cured himself of pancreatic cancer, and he did it <clears throat> with enzymes based upon Beard's work. This He wrote this book, and it started to make waves. It started to enter into the mainstream. And conventional medicine says, well, look, we got to find out whether this is real or not. Uh, basically, they were trying to debunk it, so they hired Dr. Nick Gonzalez, an MD, to review Kelly's work, not only with himself, but with hundreds of other cancer patients. After Kelly successfully cured himself, he turned around and started delivering his enzymatic therapy to other people who had cancer with remarkable success. American Medical Association got wind of this, sent in Gonzalez to investigate it, Sloan Kettering specifically, paid Nick Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez, to go visit Dr. Kelly, look at his medical records, and debunk it. Well, Dr. Gonzalez did, and he did his due diligence. And you know what he said? He said, this guy's onto something because his treatments are effective and they work. They're effective and they work. A rare medical doctor lifts his head up above the masses and speaks the truth. Now, then he was awarded a $6 million grant by the National Institute of Health. A $6 million grant to like figure this stuff out that Kelly did. Figure it out. Let's figure it out. Six million bucks. So he started to figure it out, and he did this with at the university. I'm going to tell you what the university is in a minute. I'm going to read you here something from uh, the website about what happened in Nick Gonzalez's research. So he did research to prove what Kelly was doing, but the research failed. And the research didn't fail because it was incorrect. It failed because it was sabotaged by the people who were conducting the research. And Gonzalez wrote a book about it. Here's an excerpt from it. In 1998, Nick Gonzalez, MD, received the National Cancer Institute approval for a clinical trial to evaluate his nutritional enzyme approach in the treatment of patients with pancreatic cancer. Though Dr. Gonzalez hoped the venture would initiate cooperation ha, between conventional scientists and serious alternative researchers, problems plagued the study from its inception. The design discouraged patient participation, oncologists discouraged patients from joining, and at times pressured those already admitted for nutritional therapy to change to the conventional treatment. Uh, the NCI turned over all patient selection decisions to the principal investigator, who, as it turned out, helped devise the chemotherapy regime that was used as a control treatment, and it goes on and on and on. The research that Dr. Gonzalez attempted to do was sabotaged by the researchers. And, of course, the news came out, the pancreatic enzyme therapy doesn't work. And Dr. Gonzalez wrote a book about it explaining the corruption and what went wrong inside of the research paradigm. Because most people on the street don't know these distinctions. They think that the medical professional, you know, is really trying to do a good job and it's not like that. In any event, this was a big, bad voodoo daddy as far as disseminating this information to the masses. But Dr. Gonzalez continued in his private practice in New York City to treat cancer patients with this method. And then he died a year ago. Found dead in his apartment. Died of cardiac reasons. Foul play, no foul play, nobody knows. But he was not an unhealthy human being. Interesting that he would die under seemingly strange circumstances. But the work that he does goes on. And here is basically the false placenta theory treatment in a nutshell. 
large do oral doses of pancreatic enzymes are given, and this is a problem because you can't go into a laboratory and manufacture pancreatic enzyme. Uh, biochemical science hasn't figured out how to do that yet. So in order to get pancreatic enzymes, you have to extract them from pigs, extract them from cows. You have to get them from a living animal, and that's a costly endeavor. And these are large doses that uh, Dr. Gonzalez was talking about, and also Dr. Kelly. Uh, 45,000 milligrams a day. 45,000 milligrams a day. That's four and a half grams. Four and a half grams of pancreatic enzymes a day. The, the best one that they seem to be get most clinical results with is something called alpha chymotrypsin from a pig. Alpha chymotrypsin, poor sign. Alpha chymotrypsin. Treatment costs about $2,000 a month. Difficult for a lot of people to stomach, pun intended. I mean, that's a lot of pancreatic enzymes. It's a lot. But this was his theory, right? You also give medical nutrition and naturopathic therapeutics, naturopathic cleansing therapeutics like coffee enemas, uh, liver support, uh, nutritional and herbal liver support in order to support the pancreas in its ability to manufacture its own trypsin and chymotrypsin and alpha chymotrypsin and also to help the body to detox because interestingly enough one of the downsides of this therapeutic is that it worked and as the tumors started to become dissolved the body couldn't handle all of the waste from the dead tumor cells. So patients develop toxemia from the death of the cancer cells in, the, in their body. Now, why doesn't conventional medicine look at this? Again, it's intellectual cowardice, and you're paying the price for it. What we need here is some buddy who has lots and lots and lots and lots of money to privately fund research like this in some country other than the United States, because it ain't going to fly here, ladies and gentlemen. It ain't going to fly. The Food and Drug Administration does not work for the American consumer. It works for the pharmaceutical industry, and that's just a fact. It's not conspiracy theory. And the reason why information like this, clinical treatments like this, are alternative is because we don't have a free medical market. So, sometimes, one of the aspects of this therapy was surgically remove as much of the tumor as you can because that's going to decrease the amount of dead cancer cells that the body has to try to get rid of. Makes sense? And see, the problem with conventional chemotherapy is, oh, I'm in remission. Yeah, but only for a month or a year. It's cancer comes back, Jack. And it comes back with a vengeance. It doesn't just come back. It comes back with a vengeance. At Gonzalez Clinic, Dr. Kelly's clinic, the cancer didn't come back. And I'm the quack. So here are some resources for you to educate yourself. And interestingly enough, inquiring minds want to know, why do we have to educate ourselves? Isn't this the oncologist's job? Isn't this the doctor's job? Isn't this the medical profession's job to figure this stuff out and provide it for us? Isn't it their job? Why do we have to... Figure it out. Because we don't have a free medical market. That's why. This first link here, internetwks.com, is a very interesting site. It's an old site, but it has some really pretty good information and pretty good links to kind of help you understand the bigger picture here. Uh, Dr. Kelly's website, you know, he died a long time ago, but his... Um, there are people that are helping to disseminate the information that he, he discovered in his clinical work, drkelly.info. And, of course, the Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez Foundation, dr-gonzalez.com. 
really good information here, ladies and gentlemen, which regretfully you have to bring yourself up to speed with. I mean, you know, that's tantamount to, you know, you've got a $50,000 automobile, you got a BMW, you worked hard, finally, oh, I've got my dream car, and something goes wrong with it, and instead of taking it to the BMW dealership, you have to read books and books and books about the mechanics of the BMW and figure out how to fix it yourself. You wouldn't put up with that, but that's exactly what we have to do here when it comes to cancer treatment. And where's the outrage? In addition to the books, um, which I have uh, discussed already, or the book that I've discussed already, What Went Wrong, Dr. Gonzalez's book, um, here's John Beard's book. Remember, he's the guy that started the whole thing, the Scottish gentleman in, the 19, in 1903. Uh, the Enzyme Treatment of Cancer by John Beard. The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer by Nick Gonzalez and Linda Isaacs, both MDs. And, of course, Suzanne Summers' Knockout, interviews with doctors who actually cure cancer like Dr. Gonzalez. Now, again, don't you think it's telling that as a society we need to lean on celebrities in order to bring us into the light of what's happening here outside of the pharmaceutical mainstream. This is George Orwell's nightmare, ladies and gentlemen, and you are deeply embedded in it. We have been socialized to believe that the medical doctor is the only person who has the secret decoder ring to all things medical and everybody else is a back-of-the-bus quack with substandard training. And if the medical doctor can't figure it out, well, nobody can figure it out. And even though the medical doctors fail us, even when they harm us, even when they bankrupt us, even when they kill us, we give them a pass. We write another medical insurance premium check and we bend over and give it to them. The only reason this happens is because we don't know any better and because we do not have a free medical market. In a free medical market, Patients gravitate to the therapies that work. I have a self-help health recovery program called the Dr. Glidden. It used to be called the Dr. Glidden Advocate. Now it's just the Dr. Glidden Self-Help Health Recovery Subscription Service. I have hundreds of hours of video and audio information that you can access right now to give you a heads up on actual therapeutics developed and delivered by licensed naturopathic physicians which actually attempt to cure your condition. If you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, hey look, thank God for Novocaine, right? And the sterile technique. Thank God those things are necessary sometimes. Naturopathic doctors can prescribe drugs. Did you know that? It's not the drug, it's how it's used. It's not the gun, it's how it's used. Period. So if you are at the point in your life where you're sick and tired of managing your condition, well, guess what? Join me in the light of science-based, clinically verified medical nutrition. Go to my website right now. Get a copy of my book. You can download my book, The MD Emperor Has No Clothes, for $9.99. It's an ebook. It'll be the best 10 bucks you ever sent, you ever spent. Become a subscriber access this information, and get yourself into the game of healing. You don't know what you're missing. And honest to God, your body's ability to fix itself is a thousand times greater than you've been led to believe. We don't have the magic cure-all for everything. We don't. But we have science-based, clinically verified, holistic therapeutics, which produce noticeable and measurable results. How? By supporting and promoting your body's built-in, God-given ability to fix itself. Hope you enjoyed this event. It was live. Hope you learned something. And hope, I really do hope that my tenor here has ignited a little spark in you. 
This is my redemption song of sorts. I look forward to hanging out with you so much more in the future. I am your steadfast advocate for health, Dr. Peter Glidden. See you around campus.